let me put it by start by saying that if you look at Israel in the mid 50s, mid 1950s, after all, we're covering over here formally years 40, 52 to 56. And I think, without trying to be too funny about it, you can see all we're doing is scratching the surface. So if you look at Israel in the mid 50s, how did the world look from the point of view of the tiny state of Israel? Well, uh, they won the War of Independence in 48 due to the fact that the Arabs never got their act together in terms of armaments and particularly in terms of coordinated military operations, all the Arabs often fought very credibly, very well. So Israel in the 50s said like this, just because we won the 48 war doesn't mean we're going to win all the wars. We happen to be very lucky. Um, Egypt, Jordan, Syria, the other countries never coordinated. They actually fought each other to a certain degree. Uh, we were the benefit of all that. You can't counter that all the time. Um, here we, you know, uh, you look at Glob Pasha, I mean, who, the, 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 the Arab Legion, even they're outnumbered by the Jews who have fought, fought very well. And as you know, they held on to the West Bank and the old city of Jerusalem. It's clear by the middle 50s that there's not going to be a peace settlement. I mean, to you and me today, some of a joke to suggest it. But at that time, they thought it might happen. But Eisenhower, as, and, and this was the Eisenhower's secret representative here, Robert Anderson, who goes back and forth and forth and back from all the capitals, from Tel Aviv to Cairo and there and there and the other. And they come up with one scheme after another after another. And I say that it's a positive thing. I told you before, Eisenhower was sneaky in a positive way. He said, let's not put, bring it out in the public, but let's have real negotiations going between the sides. It's not happening. Nasser basically is saying, there is no way I can, and perhaps there's no way I will, make peace with Israel. Um, Nasser himself has emerged by the mid-50s as a uniquely charismatic figure who has transformed the situation and transformed it in a negative way. Um, they didn't have such a guy like that in 1948. Ben Gurion was always afraid that the Arabs will get a, a, a knight in shining armor on a white horse, and that he'll go and organize the Arabs and lead them and do what 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 what, uh, what they weren't able to do in, in 48. All the Arab leaders in 48 were not charismatic. They were not. They didn't think of, for example, of King Farouk or somebody like that. You know, they were despotic. They were corrupt. That's good for Israel. You think? And now they got somebody who's not like that at all, who commands the adulation of the crowds and the masses. And it appears in the mid-50s that Nasser is on his way to repairing the two fundamental Arab weaknesses. He is charismatically uniting the Arabs and may one day soon obtain genuine military coordination. One gigantic coordinated Arab army. That is Israel's nightmare even today. And it looked in the 50s, more than it does today, that somebody could do it. You look at the Middle East today, ain't no way one guy's going to get all the countries together, all killing each other. I'll give you an example, the Sunnis and the Shias. Uh, I, can even, I can even go country by country, then they're all, Mitpot say, they're all blowing up each other apart. Nobody can unite Egypt, thank God. Nobody can unite uh, Syria, thank God. Nobody can unite Iraq, thank God. Nobody can unite uh, Lebanon, and, and, and so forth. Right? But at that time, it looked like one guy, and he could do it in those years. Uh, so Israel has the nightmare of a coordinated attack. And thanks to Nasser's relations with the Soviets, he's repairing the other big problem they had in 48, which was the lack of armaments. If anything, he looks in the mid-50s to be on the way to swamping Israel with the best weapons in the world. I repeat, the best weapons in the world. Uh, let's take a look at the next one. Oh, I would say, okay, fine. You see the picture of the, of the tanks and all the rest of it. Um, I repeat, in 48, the Arabs had no tanks. They had almost no air force. A lot of stuff was old-fashioned, out of date, as was the Israeli stuff. And that's the way the 48, 49 wars fought. Not now, not after 55, when Nasser's arms deal with the, with the Soviets. If Nasser accomplishes all this, and I repeat, this is how Ben-Gurion looks at the world. This is how Moshe Sharet looks at This is how the, all the Israelis look at the world. If Nasser accomplishes this, he'll be in a position to attack and defeat Israel in the not too distant future. And we all know what it would mean if he defeated Israel. In short, he is an Israeli nightmare, okay? As the sporadic fighting takes on the proportions of full-scale war, Dead and captured arms are the order of the day as both Arabs and Israelis put their nations on a full mobilization basis. NASA fought in the Arab armies defeated by the Israelis in 1948. Since then, the Middle East's newest state has fought a border war with its Arab neighbors. Israel's very existence is an affront to NASA. NASA was at the time great. Uh, danger and enemy, 
Very soon it was clear that he aspires to be the unified black world. Marcel made great speeches. He was handsome, he was eloquent. He carried fire with him. It was a catastrophe. Yeah, for Israel it was a catastrophe. So this is the way that the world looks in the mid-1950s. So what's Israel supposed to do about all this? Is this simply inevitable? And it's going to happen and hope for the best? According to Moshe Dayan, who was the ch chief of the army, uh, preventative war. We have to attack them first. That's his policy. We are not Czechoslovakia. The mid-50s was a time when Dayan was the Command in chief of the army, he had pretty much of a free reign, and he, um, sh what shall I say over here? He uh, perfected, perhaps, improved the army significantly, because after the 48 war, it had gone, it, it got run down for various reasons, and uh, he inspired it with a certain esprit de corps. And uh, here, take a look at this. Do one. Diane's private life might have been less than exemplary, but no one questioned the example of courage to set on the battlefield. I never sent any soldier on any mission that I myself was not really ready, not theoretically, but practically ready to go and do it. Never. Under Moshe Dayan's leadership, the armed forces were sharpened to a razor's edge. Through rigorous training, he instilled in the entire Israeli army the spirit of an elite commando unit, morale sword. Dan singled out one man who embodied his vision of the ideal Israeli soldier, Meyer Harzion, a hero of border skirmishes with the Arabs. In typical defiance of regulations, Dayan promoted him to officer without even making him attend officer candidate school. <coughs> Harzion's daring, ingenuity, and personal initiative were exactly what Dayan's innovative commando tactics required. Diane called him the bravest soldier he ever knew. When Hatsion was critically wounded in 1956, Diane kept vigil by his bedside and wept. After Hatsion's recovery, they would become lifelong friends. Hatsion, the farmer, the soldier, I really think that he preferred and that was the best part of him, to do the fighting alone. Very often he told his men and a, a company or a section to stay behind and he just crawled into the enemy's position and threw the enemy grenade and came back and said, it, it, it's over. Dayan set high standards for his commanders as well. He insisted that officers lead their men into battle and ordered them to take parachute training. Now this is exaggerated a little bit, but only a little bit. So even if half of this or 60% or is true, it's pretty impressive, agreed? So you see over here that Dayan's idea is like this. We're building up an army, we're making tough, it's better than the Arabs, use it. Moshe Sharet, who was the foreign minister at that time, who had to deal with the rest of the world, he said to Dayan, are you nuts, <laughs> right? And so they obviously didn't see eye to eye, that's an understatement. But Moshe Sharet said like this, I live in the real world. If Israel's branded the aggressor, then the United Nations, the rest of the world, can punish Israel militarily, politically, economically, etc. And what's your response to that? You know, what, what, what's your plan? In other words, these are uncomfortable facts. But what do you do? You don't live in a, in a, in, in a dream world. And Dayan didn't answer that. He said, you're a wimp. We'll be reasonable like Czechoslovakia. We'll be admired like Czechoslovakia. And we'll be dead like Czechoslovakia. So that's not what we want to do. You understand? And Charette, by the way, was a powerful intellect. He was a very thoughtful guy, and he wins most of the cabinet votes, which enrages Ben Gurion. So if you look at 1955, you look at 1956, every time there's a question, should they fight, should they go to war, or something like that, should they respond to the Arabs with military force, there's a vote in the cabinet, and Ben Gurion and, uh, and, and Diane breathing fire, and let's get him, and revenge, and this, that, and the other. And Charette says, and then what? And what happens when the United States does this? And what happens when England, France does that? And the United Nations does that? And the other ministers in the cabinet said, Charette is right. We don't like it, but he's right. And therefore they always vote against Ben-Gurion. So it's not true that Ben-Gurion is sort of like a dictator, although he wants to be. And so what he does is he fires Charette. Okay? <laughs> and he replaced him with Golda Meir. That's how Golda Meir became the, uh, uh, what do you call it? No, that's the one point. That's how Golda Meir became... <laughs>
what? what, 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 what. That, oops, excuse me. That's how Golda Meir became the foreign minister, and because um, uh, she promised to be a yes man. And uh, I know there's some mathematician, yes woman, I get it. The, um, <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. The, uh, <laughs> save me from the scientists, the English teachers, and the mathematicians. <laughs> Uh, no, but seriously, Ben Gurion did it because he said he wants team coordination in the foreign policy area, which means he says, I don't want somebody arguing against me in the cabinet meetings. So, uh, so that's what happens. Charette, by the way, never got over it. He uh, carried a sore thing for the rest of his life. He hit Ben Gurion. Years later, if we get to this sometimes in the future, he got revenge, like in uh, an Arab melodrama. But meanwhile, you know, he was out of he was he was out of the picture. And now, pay attention, as a reaction to the Gaza raid of February 55, which we talked about a couple weeks ago, when Israel hit the Egyptians very hard, Nasser, among other things, had closed the Straits of Tehran, ramping up the Arab-Israeli conflict by blockading a lot. I want you to understand what I'm saying. You all know the map, basically, and I know you know this. A lot's over here, and here's the Straits of Tehran, and it's easy to blockade it over here with the, with the, with the little islands over here that, that's there, and Egypt, of course, controls this, the Sinai Peninsula. And after the 48-49 war, they never talked about it in the armistice agreements. So in the years 49, 50, 51, 52, and all that, Egypt just never made a big deal out of it, and Israel didn't. Um, starting in the mid-50s, Ben-Gurion starts talking about building this up as a port, which it never was. And oh, maybe in the biblical times it was. And um, going to say, Israel's going to sink a lot of money into it because it's their little toehold, as you see, on that part of the world, which could possibly lead to trade with Africa and trade with Asia going this way and down there. Um, now, as I say before, Nasser never did anything about it, but when Israel surprise attacked him in February of 55 and blew up all those Egyptian soldiers and this sort of thing and the other, he wanted to get back in many ways. And one of the ways he did was by saying that no Israeli shipping can come through here. Now, here's the thing. In reality, there wasn't any shipping. There was hardly any commerce in lot. It was a Zionist enterprise. It was part of Ben-Gurion's Negev mania, his whole vision over there. Here's Ben-Gurion, who's even willing to put on a hat and go to a bris in order to encourage people to go and, and settle in, in, in lot, uh, which at that time was not a fun place. It's not the hotels and the air conditioning of now. And, uh, so to, but Israel wanted to do it, and he had big ideas which have never come to fruition so far, that the Negev will be the future of Israel, and that millions, I repeat, millions of Jews will be able to set on the wide open spaces. Maybe you never heard of the Bedouins or whatever, but the bottom line is that they thought that this would be a great future of Israel. Uh, the north of Israel, he didn't have much time for, too many Arabs in the Galilee. The center of Israel is a narrow waist. The only area Israel has any uh, real territory is in the Negev, and therefore, oh my goodness, blockading the Negev is just terrible. Even though Eisenhower on the other side, I guess, it's not exactly like you got ships coming in and out of there, you know, like, what, what, what's the big deal? Um, in reality, as I said before, there wasn't much commerce. But psychologically, it is a blockade. And, right? I mean, when somebody says, I'm, I'm, I'm not letting your ships through, it is kind of angry. And to Dayan, it's a perfect casus belli, you know, uh, cause of war. After all, in international law, you blockade me, that's, and it's an act of war. And so, you do that to me, I have the right to hit you. And don't give me this proportional business I said before, just because you smack me in the face doesn't mean the only thing I'm allowed to do is smack you across the face. Who gave you the right to smack me in the face in the first place? I can kick you. And that's Dayan's, that's Dayan's uh, attitude over there. Ben-Gurion himself was funny. He was caught in the middle between the extremes of Dayan and Sharet. On the one hand, he'd love to hit the Arabs. It would enhance, if, 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 if it would enhance Israel's security. But would it? And how exactly would it do, do so? The, the painful questions that Moshe Shirek keeps asking, you know, he says, and then what? What happens the next day? What happens the next day? And um, the result is, as you see before, there's a lot of disagreement in the highest echelons of the Israeli government. On the other hand, Israel does not have the weapons also, or certainly not enough of them. What if it's a long war? Last week, we talked about Paris in France, and yeah, he did amazing things all the rest, but still, in spite of everything that he got, whatever he got, it still was very minimal. And Israel did not then, and I'm not sure it has today, the capacity for a long war. Some of us will remember the 73 war, in which after a week or so, they had to beg Nixon because they ran out of bullets. Remember that? And, they, and, and, they ran, we, you know, they, and, and thank God Nixon made a big uh, airlift. Um, there's a difference between it being able to have a war, six day war, six days is one thing, six weeks is another thing. And so Ben-Gurion doesn't know which way it's going to go. 
And also, what about the international community? Remember those guys? Um, by this time, the head of the United Nations was the Swedish Dag Hammarskjöld, who was not pro-Israel at all. Uh, not at all. And uh, Anthony Eden hates Israel. Uh, John Foster Dulles, it's a Shiloh. We'll talk about that. Uh, Khrushchev hates Israel. Duh. And so the international community is not what you call friendly towards Israel going to war against the Arabs. And Ben-Gurion, although he hates it, knows it. Nevertheless, like other Israeli leaders, or many of them, Ben-Gurion does think, gee, wouldn't it be great to fix the errors of 1948? Remember we talked in the past how Israel really had the ability, if Truman didn't stop them, to take over the whole of Israel. The whole West Bank, I'm talking about in 48, 49. The whole West Bank, the whole Gaza Strip, wouldn't have all this junk that we're dealing with now, all the rest of it, and Truman stopped them. Now, he stopped them and left them with lousy borders, which I've spoken about again and again. It's just perfectly understandable from a psychological point of view that Ben-Gurion, the Israelis, dreamed, gee, wouldn't it be great if one day we just take all that and maybe kick all the Arabs out or something like that uh, it's, a, it's a dream. And so that's pushing him in, in, in the direction of trying to do something about it. But the truth is, Ben-Gurion is living in a fantasy. He imagines that it will be possible to redraw the maps of the Middle East and that Israel will get the Litani River, by the way, to move the border north in, in Lebanon, which, of course, which, which will solve their water problems decisively. Because if they get the Litani River, which is 20, 30 miles north of the Israeli border in Lebanon, that takes care of all the water that Israel will ever need. Um, and other water sources, he dreams of conquering the Golan Heights, because once you have the Golan Heights, the Syrians can never be a threat to you from over there. Uh, this would solve the water problem, many other problems. W what he didn't realize is once these guys, back in 1919 at the Treaty of Versailles and, and so forth, made the map of the Middle East, it has never been changed till today, nor was it changeable. Right? Here we are almost 100 years later, and um, once borders are fixed, the 20th century is demonstrated. Think about what I'm about to tell you. So once the 20th century is fixed, once the borders are made, no one has ever been able to change them. Saddam Hussein was not able to annex Kuwait. Right? Uh, Egypt and these other countries not able to take over pieces of other countries. Uh, even the Russians, very legalistic, and uh, was it not at all an easy business for Stalin to change the borders after the end of World War II, nor were these agreed to by the international community until the Helsinki Treaty of 1975, which the Russians bend over backwards to get a Western approval of, it ain't simple. But Ben-Gurion doesn't get that, you see? Because he was born in the 1800s. And he thinks like the 19th century. And in those days, oh, Bismarck annexed Alsace-Lorraine, and Russia took over this territory, and every time there's a war, somebody got something out of something, right? The Balkan Wars of 1912 and 13, Bulgaria doubled, and Serbia this, and then, you know, and he started thinking in those terms you get it, he didn't understand. He's still thinking in those terms like, oh, Israel will have a war, and we'll have a little of this and a little of that. Uh, true, we made some concessions back in 48, 47. That was at that time, but we'll make things work out in the end. This is Lulu land. I mean, you know, he, he doesn't understand the international uh, situation. Lloyd George, the Prime Minister of England, was a smart guy, and one of these, that's Lloyd George right there. Well, hold on, hold on, Jake. He says, Lloyd George, <laughs> Lloyd George back in, in, 19, uh, back in, in the time of the world, First World War, and right after, said to Chaim Weizmann, and he liked Chaim Weizmann. He's like, he says, whatever you do, figure out your borders, make your move now, because the glacier moves once in a millennium. You understand? And by that he meant, you understand what I'm saying? He said, now is a chance for the Balfour Declaration, the Jews will get whatever territory they get, and that's it for a long, long time, maybe forever. So figure it out what you're going to do, because don't f think that this is going to change. Um, I repeat, Lloyd George was pro-Zionist. He is the one who made the Balfour Declaration, even though he called the Balfour Declaration, really the Lloyd George Declaration, and he wanted to help the Jews and all the rest of it. There's no question about that. Uh, but he was enough of a realist to say like this, you get a shot once. Here's a famous speech that Lloyd George gives with Chaim Weizmann in there. You see the two of them are buddies. In 1932. <laughs> Weizmann. On the western part of the Mediterranean, three of the greatest powers on earth, representing between them one third of the total inhabitants of the globe. They issued a decree after the future government and development of a small but 
He said the right of a Jew in Tel Aviv is as much a right to, entitled as much to protection by the British government as that of a Mohammedan, of a Muslim in Kampur. Kampur is in India. Uh, this is almost a, in other words, at the time he said it, they meant it well. But you know and I know subsequent developments didn't turn out that way. Uh, Indian Empire, under the British, when the British ruled it, was a mix, a combination of, of, of India and Pakistan. It's all one big thing. And there were millions of Hindus and Muslims living all over the place. And there were lots of Hindus living in Muslim areas and lots of Muslims living in Hindu areas, like a Mohammedan in Kanpur living in a, in a Hindu area. And he was saying that, is, is, that they're entitled by Britain to be protected as a minority if they happen to be in that situation, same way a Jew is, and Tel Aviv is a minority in the greater a, a, a Middle East. However, what really happened? In 1947, the British simply said, we're out, <laughs> right? And uh, millions, I repeat, millions of Hindus and Muslims killed each other. Hear what I said, millions? This they don't talk about so much. They talk about Israel. Millions of Hindus and Muslims killed each other. And whoever was Hindu on this side fled here, and whoever was Muslim on this side fled here, until they ended up with the borders of India and Pakistan. No, they didn't. They're still fighting over the borders today. Because it never was settled by the United Nations, and because it wasn't settled and the Treaty of Versailles and one of those types of things, the, it's not possible to bring peace to India, Pakistan, but that the world doesn't talk about. Um, what makes it even worse, India and Pakistan both have A-bombs. <laughs> and India and Pakistan both ready to use it. And this is one of the reasons why, even though in the time of the 50s, India was one of the big enemies of Israel, today they're one of the big friends. The reason they're friends is they're afraid of the Pakistanis in the Muslim world attacking India. If you can disentangle all that, <laughs> you're smarter than I thought. The, um, <laughs> meanwhile, in 1956, the Middle East situation is heating up all the time. Here are the border raids. Remember we talked about in Kfar Chabad, they walked in and shot all those kids, Dabani Marav, and the, and the blood all over the place. This is going on all day, and Israel is doing the same thing on the other side. Israel raids on Jordan, because that's where these guys came from, threatens the Jordanian regime, and almost leads to England declaring war on Israel pursuant to their defense treaty with Jordan. This was the big item in the news if you lived in the 50s. Once upon a time, Jordan was a client state, an ally of Britain. And when the British pulled out, they drew up a defense treaty with Jordan, which Jordan clinged to, which said that if Jordan's ever attacked by another country, England will go to war to defend Jordan. It also said that if England's attacked by another country, Jordan will go to their defense. Right. And, and, and even though that sounds funny, I get it, but it really isn't, because for example, in World War II, when England went to war against uh, Germany and Italy, the Jordanians put whatever force they had and their transportation that was at the disposal of British, which I promise you did help the British in the war effort. So I, I, I know the jokes, but there really is a defense treaty between the two of them. And the uh, Glob Pasha was the commander in chief of the Jordanian army, King Hussein, and Zayden. No, thanks to the fact that Israel is constantly hitting Jordan so hard and Glob Pasha can't do anything about it, he's fired. And instead they put a pro Nasser guy in as the commander in chief of the Jordanian army. And Eisenhower says to Israel, well done, you idiots, right? You, did you improve your situation? And Israel said, no, 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 uh, it doesn't work like that. You know, the Jordanians keep hitting us, you have to, you have to hit them back. And Anthony Eden is saying, yeah, I'm willing to go to war in, in the Middle East against Israel, okay? And so the situation is getting more complicated all the time. Meanwhile, so this is not one movie, it's 10 movies operating at the same time. Nasser, for his own reasons, for his own reasons, has gotten into a quarrel with England over the Suez Canal. 
Now here you have to understand a little bit of history. The Suez Canal was not built by Egyptians. It was built by a Frenchman, Ferdinand de Lesseps. He. he was hired by the ruler of Egypt at that time to build a canal. Do you understand? But it was the 19th century, so he had capitalism. And therefore, it's a, it's a company, and there are shares. And the ruler of Egypt, Said Pasha, Port Said, Said Pasha, uh, he said, uh, we'll have you know, 51% or something like that of the shares, but Ferdinand de Lesseps will have so-and-so many shares, and other investors will have so-and-so many shares. And they all made money on it. They all made money on it. Uh, when he died, he was succeeded by his son, Ismail Pasha. <coughs> These guys are the Khedives of Egypt. That is to say, they're the hereditary governors of the province of Egypt, which formerly was under the Turkish Empire, but in reality was its own country. And here, for not a long time, for about five, six years, that's the way the situation went. The thing is, this guy was a rough guy. This guy was a playboy, Ismail Pasha. Therefore, he blew all the money in parties and Monaco and this and that and the other. And the result is, he's really strapped for cash. And this is the 19th century before you had what you call today foreign aid and all this sort of thing. And so what do you do for cash? In this context, England bought the Suez Canal. Now, I'm going to show, don't show this yet. Wait, hold it for a second. He said, because well, I, I want to tell you about this. I found this on the YouTube. They did a movie or something about the Israeli, and, uh, who was the Prime Minister of England in 1875, Benjamin Disraeli. Now, understand this well. He had converted Jew. At the age of 13, his father had a fight with the Shoal, and at the Shoal, the Shoal, that he hates them, he converted all of his kids. Uh, that's Jews for you. And the, by the way, the father, the father did not convert. Isn't that interesting? The father didn't convert, but he made all the children convert. That's really sick, you know, because he wouldn't be able to go back to the Shoal and stick it to him. So because of this, Benjamin Disraeli was, was a guy. And as a result of that, the laws in England that you can't run for office and can't participate in politics didn't apply to him, even though other than religion, he was as Jewish looking and as Jewish mannerisms as anybody could possibly be. So it's an extraordinary story of how somebody like this, who's a complete outsider, rose to the top in the English system in a world of lords and barons and graduates of Oxford and Cambridge, of which he was none, and you know, hereditary privilege and all that sort of thing, and of all things to be head of the Conservative Party, <laughs> right? It's even more. But nevertheless, it happened. Uh, he got Lord Darby and the two of them together. The conservative says, our party is run by a jockey and a Jew. You know, that's uh, because of the derby, you know. So anyway, the, p the point is that when Disraeli was in office, he's a very smart guy. He, I want you to hear this story because how this plays out in Jewish history is crazy. Um, and he found out early on that uh, the ruler of Egypt is, in, uh, is, is harder for cash and the Suez Canal uh, can be bought or a lot of shares in it can be bought, as you'll see in a minute. But it was like on a Saturday, I think. And they, when they had the cabinet meeting. And you need cash now, 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 now. And parliament wasn't in office. Parliament wasn't in session. And the banks, including the Bank of England, which is the central bank, was closed. So there's no way to get cash. And Ismail Pasha wants cash. You know what I'm saying? Nothing else works. And uh, but he must have big debts and so forth. And uh, so how are you going to do it? You can't raise the cash. You have to have a vote in Parliament. You have to all the rest of it. And the sum was something of four million pounds, which was a vast sum in those days. The answer is go to Rothschild. And to go on, on child, you'll see. You'll, this is a true story. So he sends his equerry, his, his um, assistant, uh, to, to go to Rothschild. They don't show it there exactly correctly. It was like Chavez. Not that Rothschild was so from, but he kept Chavez. And uh, you know, at the table, and basically walked in and said like this, we, need, we wanted the Suez Canal, we need the money now, and we have four million pounds. And you don't do this with a banker, correct? Because the banker's like this, what are the terms, what's this? I'll cut you a check, Parliament says no, I'm stuck here with the money, all the rest of it. It's famous, the Rothschild said like this, well, who, who needs it, the British government, done. And he gave him the money, not on Chavez, he wrote after, this is a true story. He cut the check later, but they gave him that night, and they sent it to Egypt, and it's done. When it's all over, Parliament meant like a week later or something like that, it was a fait accompli, and all the newspapers said, oh, now England controls such a big part. So afterwards, they voted to give the money back to Rothschild. You see? So I'm saying this. Why the Suez you know, Canal? The 177,000 shares owned by the Khedive. But is there any certainty he'll sell? After years of colossal extravagance, he has made his country almost totally bankrupt. Our agent in Cairo tells us he has given an option on his shares to a French syndicate. For how much? 92 million francs. Three, six, eight. 
£3,680,000. Then there's no point the French have it. No, 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 not yet. This is the weekend. They have until Tuesday. Now, they would sell to us at once for a higher sum and in cash. A higher sum? Four million pounds. Oh, well, it's out of the question. It is an international waterway. We have more interest in it than anyone else. Four-fifths of the ships that use it are British. But why do we have to buy it? To make sure that no one prevents us using it. The possibility of that link being cut is an enormous threat to India, with Russia already poised on its northern borders. Yes, of course, but we cannot make a hasty decision. In any case, the Khedive shares are less than half. We would still not control it. We would have by far the largest holding, and with the few shares we already own and more... <laughs> right, now you make Abdullah. The, uh, it's, a, it's, it's a famous but remarkable story. I repeat, if you're Gamma Abdul Nasser or the guys in charge say, what does that tell you? The whole Suez Canal. Anyway, um, because England controls the Suez Canal, this is one of the great moves in British history, that is why they win World War I and World War II. There is no way they could win World War I and World War II without it. Wow. Here's the Mediterranean. The British hold the chokeholds here and here, right? The ships can only get into the Mediterranean through, through Gibraltar, which I know you know is a British colony and a famous naval base. And here, uh, to get in this way or to get out, you've got to go through the Suez Canal. So if England holds Gibraltar and Suez, then the enemy is stuck. That is why the Germans did not win the First World War. It's one of the big reasons. And that's one of, the, one of the really big reasons why Hitler did not win World War II. It's not a piquant episode in British history. It was a strategic move of the first rank. I mean, it really contributed majorly to British security. So it's, uh, as Nishkin Klanikite, and the reason I'm telling you that is because of what's going about to follow. You can understand that this is a Jewish audience, so we look at this like smiling and all the rest of it. But everything I just described to you is an outrage to Egyptian nationalism. After all, the Suez Canal is in Egypt. And the ruler was Port Sa uh, Mohammed Said. And 
The British did a shtick, which you just saw they did, to grab and take advantage of the fact that the ruler of Egypt, without consulting his people, was just a spendthrift and a playboy and a party animal, and as a result, he needed money, and he gave away the most valuable item in Egypt to the British for a song, and so on and so forth. Notice it really bothers the Egyptians about all this. At that time, there's a gigantic 80 foot statue of Ferdinand de Lesseps at the entrance of the Suez Canal. Uh, if you're French or European, it's kind of cute. If you're Egyptian, what does it tell you? Meanwhile, Nasser, because of the Shachanus of Cho and Lai, as I told you last week at the Bandung Conference, recognized Red China. Dulles and England angrily pulled the funding, as I told you last time, from the Aswan Dam. And Nasser, enraged, wanted to hit back. And how do you get back, at the British particularly, and even at the Americans? He decides, in the middle of 1956, to unilaterally confiscate the Suez Canal, even though England does not want to sell. They call it nationalism, nationalizing. He said, we have the, it's our territory, and even though the British own it, we're taking over it, and we'll pay you or not pay you as, as, as we see fit. But you don't have the, your, your personal property rights. It's a matter of capitalism. Don't trump our national rights, that's our national territory. Um, Nasser does so in the most dramatic speech in Egyptian history, which they, which they memorize in the schools today. I, I don't blame them from their point of view. Uh, here, take a look at this. In the stifling July heat, Nasser makes his way to Alexandria's Manchia Square, where he is to deliver his speech. Once again, his people wait to hear if he will respond to the West's denial of funding for the Aswan Dam. At 9 p.m., Nasser climbs the podium. The speech is long. Nasser catalogues the centuries of humiliations the Egyptians have suffered at the hands of the West. His tone is measured, but angry. Nasser now reveals to the world what the employees of the Suez Canal Company have just discovered. Across Egypt, there is pandemonium. It was a bombshell, of course, absolute bombshell. We listened to this thing, nobody expected People were rejoicing in the street. I celebrated with all the Russians. <coughs> You could understand that Egyptians would be enthusiastic about it. I understand that. The British Prime Minister, Anthony Eden, shocked and humiliated and literally freaks out. After all, it doesn't get worse than this. He's supposed to be the heir to the Israeli. He's a conservative government. He's a person who fought against Hitler, fought in the First World War, champion of the British Empire and everything that stands for, and so forth. And you're taking away, just unilaterally, one of their best assets. And who's doing it? A tin horn dictator. That's how he sees it. And he's got the chutzpah to do this to England. Oh boy, it doesn't get worse than that. Now, John Foster Dulles said, look, it wasn't right, but he's all, let's negotiate some kind of compensation package. Right? Dulles is saying, let's keep our heads on this. But of course, this infuriates Anthony Eden. He said, if they took away the Panama Canal, you wouldn't talk like that. Right? <laughs> and Anthony Eden has one idea, I want Nasser dead. Okay, so being pro-Arab, now he's, at least regarding Egypt, shifting 180 degrees to become literally freaked out, obsessive over the issue of Nasser. Take a look at this from his uh, number two guy at the uh, Prime Minister's office, Anthony Nutting. The firm attitude that the government has adopted is not a... Foreign Office Minister Anthony Nutting is one of the first to realize just how far the Prime Minister is now prepared to go over an open line, having just said, it's me. But we started a violent argument on 
on the telephone, and he was very violent in that conversation, um, and uh, ended up by shouting at me, I don't want Nasser neutralized, I want him destroyed. Okay, so no, Eden is just losing all sense of proportion, but you can understand. He pressed him in the wrong place. He pressed the button of the British Empire. And, uh, and then now, uh, whatever the rest of the British government feels, Anthony wants to get Nasser. Now, at the same time, ho you know, hold that thought. <laughs> and now let's move across the British Channel to, to English Channel to, to France. Guy Mollet, the Prime Minister, I told you least ago, of France, the Socialist Prime Minister of France, the Algerian Revolt is intensifying, and Nasser is the main backer of the terrorists, as they call him. Nasser's nationalization of the Suez Canal is in the mind of French Prime Minister Guy Mollet, part of a general plan to control the Mediterranean. do not see this as a one-off sort of thing, and a shtick of Nasser because he's angry about the Aswan Dam. He sees this as repeating what Hitler did. First Hitler went into Rhineland, and then he went over uh, Austria, and then it was uh, Sudetenland. And then it was, you know, he wanted to take up everything. And his first move is here, and his second move is there. And he wants to create a giant fascist Arab state, which will then attack democratic free Europe, and especially France. That's how he sees it. During the interview that Molay gives with Henry Luce, the, the editor of, famous editor of Time magazine, he holds a copy of Nasser's book, Philosophy of the Revolution. And he says to Henry Luce, read it. This is Nasser is Mein Kampf. If we are too stupid not to read it and understand it and draw the obvious conclusions, then so much the worse for us. So in his mind, it's France in 1935, France in 1936. Either we make a, if we only would have gone against Hitler when he was weak and done the right thing, we could have spared ourselves the war, Second World War, the defeat of France, the Holocaust, and all the rest of it. Let us not make the same mistake twice. That's how the French see it. So all three countries, Israel, England, France, each one for a completely separate reason, in the late summer of 1956, have concluded that Nasser is another Hitler. Israel did it because Nasser wants to wipe out the Jews and throw them in the sea. France does it because they see Nasser in, in his writings and elsewhere in, in his in backing of the Algerians and so forth, creating a Hitler-type empire. And England, what do you want? He just stole the Suez Canal from us. You see? You know, that, that proves to you where it's going. And so, the idea of Nazi being Hitler is, 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 is a, a matter of consensus in these three capitals. All three have concluded that America is bad or obtuse. Why doesn't Eisenhower see it this way? What's wrong with Dulles? Dulles always was a bad guy. Atchison should be, that's what they say, you know? Dulles is, is, is stupid and he's myopic. And Eisenhower knew what he wanted. The guy just had a bad heart attack in late 55. He had intestinal blockage in March or so of, uh, I'm serious, this put him out of commission. People don't remember this. Eisenhower had real, it's, it's amazing he got reelected with this, but he did. And then after he got reelected, he got a stroke in second term. Uh, no politician could survive it the way Ike did at that time, but he did. Um, and so the British and the French, they're like, oh, Nebuch, the guy's over the hill, and so forth, he, does, he doesn't quite get it. Um, America should be backing us. Guy Mollet of France, in particular, is angry because he was offered a deal by Molotov, but he stayed loyal to the NATO. The Russians, fishing in troubled waters, why not? That's what you do. Said to France, we, the Soviets, let's make a deal. We'll back out of all support for the Arab terrorists and the Algerians and all that sort of thing, and we'll side with France. In return, you pull out of NATO. Well, de Gaulle took that deal a few years later. True or not? De Gaulle did it. And Guy Mollet, being an anti-communist, democratic, socialist, pro-Western type guy, scornfully turned it down. And so he says to Eisenhower and Dulles, we could have had a good deal, but out of loyalty to you, we turned it down. Why don't you, out of loyalty to us, help us? He can't see it, you understand? So he's particularly angry over there. Now, by the way, as I said before, um, 10 years later, less than 10 years later, Charles de Gaulle, in a different set of circumstances, takes a deal like that, and as you know, pulls out of NATO in order to kiss up and get good relations with the Russians. And he got the chutzpah to say to Dean Rusk, the Secretary of State, I want every American soldier taken out of France. And Dean Rusk says, including these guys? <laughs> you know, tens of thousands of American soldiers killed to liberate France. He said, I want every soldier out there. But you know, the French <coughs> are the French. But I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the French were still the French back in the 50s. And so 
the leaders of France, especially the two top guys who at this particular point are Mole, the socialist prime minister, and Bourge Manoury, who I spoke about last week, a great thing, the defense minister, they say, literally, they say, to hell with America, let's hook up with Israel and attack Egypt together. And because they talked to Shimon Paris, who I told you was every three, four days in Paris anyway, he was, and so they say, you know, it's terrible what's going on with Nasser, and Shimon Paris says, I know, and he says, it's, it's unbelievable he's another Hitler, I know, and we should do something about this, I know, and so on August 7th, Shortly after the nationalization of the Suez Canal, Bourges Manoury, the French leader, says to Shimon Paris informally, you know, uh, what do I, and this is how they do it in, in diplomacy. Just as a theoretical, I'm not saying this is true, just as a totally theoretical kind of situation, what would happen if we said we want to fight Egypt? Would Israel join us? And Shimon Paris says, yes. <laughs> On September 1st, a few weeks later, 1956, the French government formally asks Israel this. It's no longer a theoretical. He says, will you help us if we go against it? Big Gordon says, yes. By September 6th, 1956, this is six weeks before the, the, the um, what do you call it, the, 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 the actual war, uh, the, uh, the number two to Moshe Dayan, General Mayor Amit, the, the, the chief of his uh, staff, now the chief of staff, chief of staff, uh, is already holding military coordination discussions with the top French high command, with General uh, uh, Eli and uh, General Schall and the others. Um, I mean, they're talking tachlis over here, logistics and, and, and strategy. Um, nobody knows about this at the moment. Israel basically says like this, as General Mitt says, look, you give us the necessary planes and the tanks and all that other stuff, we're ready to go now. For Israel, it's the ideal way to get the weapons. You see, Israel has been begging everybody, we need planes, we need this, that, and the other. If we're really going to have a war, that's great. Then give us 100 planes, give us 200 tanks, give us this, that, and the other, because we're going to need it. Okay? France says, it's a good idea, but we really need the cooperation of England, particularly for the airfields of Cyprus. Uh, they they want to uh, attack Egypt using this as their base. You see, Cyprus is close. Israel said, what about this? The negative is closer. And the French say, nah, we'd rather have Cyprus, you know, and we want Britain in, in, in part of the whole thing. Ben-Gurion says to the French, how are you going to get England on our side? Anthony Eden hates us, which was true. And he's always been threatening to attack us over Jordan. I told you a minute ago, at this time, England was considering whether to invade Israel because Israel attacking Jordan. Can you follow all this? <laughs> okay. Um, France says, don't worry, Nasser is causing Anthony Eden to reassess. Ben Gurion says, an anti Semit like Anthony Eden, I don't believe it. Okay? And especially, the British foreign minister, the foreign secretary, Selwyn Lloyd, under Anthony Eden, really anti israel fire breather, really, it's, it's the foreign office, it's Whitehall, it's the bureaucrats. If only the world didn't have Israel. Actually, if you ask them by themselves when nobody's looking, if only the world didn't have the Jews. You see? Yeah. So, uh, Ben Gordon can't believe it. But the French actually know what they're talking about because they've been holding secret talks with England. Anthony Eden is so freaked out over by Nasser, he starts to do the unthinkable. He starts to like Israel. <laughs> sort of. Okay? Um, Anthony Eden believes his own intelligence reports, because he wants to, that Nasser is unpopular, a secret communist, and that he's easy to overthrow. Right? After all, the CIA put the Shah of Iran in in 1953, that's three years earlier, through a coup because whoever was in charge wasn't so popular. They just rented a few crowds, and next thing you got a revolution. Nasser also, tin horn dictator, you know, uh, a, a, a one-party state, just a talker. Now this was not correct, right? This was not accurate. But you believe what you want to believe, right? The, 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 you know, the reports that don't jive with what you're thinking, you disregard. And the few reports that jive with what you're thinking, you, you hook on to. And that's what happened against the opposition of the Whitehall bureaucracy. This is, and, you know, nobody could make this happen except the good Lord. <laughs> against the total opposition of the Foreign Office and all the bureaucrats, all the rest of it, Anthony Eden fixes on the idea of joining the French and even the Israelis. Hold your nose. <laughs> okay? It's tough for him. But, you know, you got to do what you got to do. So Joy talks. This is a shidduch no one could ever have predicted. And it made no sense 
But we know Shaduchim are sometimes like that. <laughs> so joint talks begin between the generals of the three countries. Originally, the British thought to take out Egypt on their own together with the French without the Israelis. But once they saw how logistically formidable a challenge it was, they start listening to the French to bring in the Israelis. In other words, Jake, is it possible to go back to that map from a minute ago? Yeah. yeah. You think, take over Egypt. This is a lot of territory. And it's mil tens of millions of people over here. All of a sudden, when you start moving from the armchair discussions to practical logistics of how you're going to land the soldiers and how many men do you need and all this sort of things and how many uh, cans of food and, and, and tanks and all the rest. When you get Lamaisa, you know, Israel would be pretty good. <laughs> right? you, get it, you, you can't deny, even though he wants to, the obvious utility of the great Israeli army. In general, the French, the Israelis rather, deal with the French and not the British. Because the British feel very uncomfortable and anti Israel. And the French are literally the Shachanim in the middle. Okay? And so there is a British general, and there's a French general appointed to command these uh, two operations, but the, Brit the Israelis prefer to deal with the French guy. Ben Gurion is starting to get a little nervous, giddy perhaps, and he said, because he, he, listen, this was his dream to fight the Arabs with the British and the French on your side, it's Min HaShamayim. <laughs> as he sees it, as he sees it. Ben Gurion, though, said, there needs to be a clear political framework, not just unspoken understandings. What is the goal of all this? What can Israel expect from its allies? How do we know we won't stick ourselves out on a limb and the British and the French saw off the limb? After all, who are we dealing with? Perfidious Albion, the French. I mean, the Europeans are famous for promising the moon and then stabbing you with the back. That, the, Europe is where they do this, okay? Uh, it's a sensible idea and indeed, one of the flaws of the plan being developed by the Anglo-French planners is a lack of a clear goal. This is very important in, in, in the military. We know this in, in, in American history. We've learned the hard way. And every country that doesn't learn this military lesson will learn the hard way as well. You don't stop when they go to war. What's the purpose? To fight? Are you crazy? What's the point? What's the purpose? If you don't have an exact goal, right, then you go on fighting even when it doesn't work anymore, and you don't know what, when to stop. In America, we call this Vietnam. <laughs> True? To be, if you want to get down to it, we also call it Korea. Uh, this is why FDR said unconditional surrender. At least we have a goal in World War II. When you don't have a goal, the consequences are devastating. But on the other hand, a lot of people, when you ask them, what is your exact goal, they don't like to answer those types of questions. And so the British and the French, like, what exactly do they want? Now, really, what they want is to knock out Nasser, kill him, and put in some kind of puppet government or something like that in Egypt. But they don't want to say it that way, you see? And so the Anglo-French plan of operation against Egypt was fatally flawed because they didn't know what exactly and where it's going and what's your backup plan and things of this nature. But this is what's necessary in any kind of a, a war. Look, this is the problem we've had in Iraq. Isn't that true? So. Um, after a lot of secret messaging back and forth between the leaders of the three countries, they agreed to hold a secret meeting outside of Paris at Sèvres, it's a suburb, in late October of 1956. So this is uh, approximately a month after uh, Yom Kippur. Ben Gurion is there, he flies in, with Paris and Dayan. Guy Mollet is there with his foreign minister, Christian Pinot, and his uh, and, and, and defense minister over there. Um, and so far, so good. So you got, you got the uh, Israelis, and you got the, uh, the French. What about the British? Anthony does not come. He said, I guess I have to be able to say in Parliament, I have, I've never met Ben-Gurion, I never spoke to him, I have nothing plausible deniability. In the Gemara, they call this, uh, what is it, Kanya de Rava, you know, you know the famous story? Uh, a guy owed money, and they took him to Basedin, and they said, you know, he says, are you ready to swear? that you don't owe the other guy money, and he was lying, of course. He said, I am ready to swear. But what he did is he put the money that the guy, let's say he owed him $100. He put $100 in a cane, such as you're over there. And when the time came to swear, he told his, uh, the plaintiff, he says, hold this for me for a minute while I swear. And he, says, and, and he says, I swear I don't have any money belonging to the other guy. You see? 
and then he took the cane back. So there's Anthony Eden, you get it? They said, I want to be able to say in Parliament, he says, I've had no meetings with the Israelis, I've signed nothing, I know nothing about this altogether. And so what he did was, he sends his foreign secretary, Solomon Lloyd, who comes and hates participating in all this, he can't stand Israel, he can't stand Israel, but never, you do what you got to do for England. And um, they come in there, and Selwyn Lloyd says like this, look, England has holdings and allies in the Arab world. It cannot be seen to be allied with Israel against Egypt. So Ben Gurion says, so what are we here for? <laughs> so Selwyn Lloyd says, a subterfuge is necessary. Israel must unilaterally invade Egypt and conquer the Sinai Peninsula. After a couple days, as Sahel gets close to the Suez Canal, England and France will then intervene as quote-unquote peacekeepers and seize the Suez Canal in the name of peace. And those will say, Israel and Egypt are going to have a war, we want to separate them, the area to separate between the Suez Canal, we will, in the interest of international peace and goodwill, take over the Suez Canal and keep the two armies apart. And Der Chaga will also control the Suez Canal. Okay? Um, this, is how it, th 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 this, is, this is how it works. Uh, that way, they will not be helping Israel, chas v'shalom. They'll be able to say, this is purely neutral and impartial and all the rest of it. Uh, it's so British, it's so French. <laughs> yeah. uh, unspoken over here, right? Unspoken is what happened afterwards. All of them hope that the conquest of the Sinai Peninsula and the Allied occupation of the Suez Canal and its environs will shock the Egyptian people, result in the fall of Nasser, and his replacement by a pro-Western government. Not that they had any idea who it's going to be, not that they had any people in, uh, ready to go, not that they had some kind of spy network set up. It's, it's just a, a, a series of wishes. Now, again in spoken, is the assumption by Ben-Gurion that Israel will break the blockade by occupying Sharm el-Sheikh, that Israel will get to keep the Gaza Strip as a kind of tikkun, shall we say, for 1948, and there's even the possibility, in Ben-Gurion's mind, maybe we can even get to keep the Sinai Peninsula. Okay? I told you before, he's thinking in the 19th century, he's thinking like the Israeli Bismarck or something like that, and you know, maybe we could do some good business out of this whole thing. Uh, that would be nice, Israel would quadruple in size. Um, so all these actors are a little bit not rational, but nevertheless they do it. Ben-Gurion is seriously fantasizing, but what the heck. What is actually agreed upon is this. Because they sign a paper. What's actually agreed upon is this. Israel fears condemnation by the United Nations. But the only body in the United Nations that legally has the power to actually condemn a country and take action against the country is the Security Council. The Security Council has five permanent members. Uh, America, Russia, China, England, France. England, France, ah. Whenever any one of those countries votes against something, veto. Doesn't happen. You get it? You see where it's going? And so, at Sevres, England and France secretly promise to veto any UN action against Israel. To ben he says, it doesn't get better than this. Okay? It means Israel cannot be stopped from seeing the thing through to total victory. And Dag Hammarskjöld have his hands tied. The UN can't do anything because only the Security Council can do something. And this way, Security Council will be stopped. As for America, because what, what will Eisenhower do? Well, this is October 24th, 1956. The election is in 12 days. The American presidential election. And the election is in full swing. It's most unlikely that Eisenhower will move against Israel and so forth and England and France during an election. It's almost a truism, isn't it? You know, all the presidents kiss up to Israel for the votes in the middle of the election. Especially when the Democrats, under Adlai Stevenson, are attacking Eisenhower for being anti-Israel. Stevenson was the Democratic candidate, very intelligent guy. Famous story about Stevenson is he gave a speech, I think it was actually in Maryland, and a lady came home to afterwards, and she says, Governor Stevenson, all the thinking people of America are voting for you. And he says, that's not enough, I need a majority. <laughs> <laughs> So Adlai, Adlai Stevenson is saying, oh, Eisenhower has denied Israel weapons and all this sort of thing. Uh, Eisenhower wants to win New York. He wants to win Illinois. He wants to win Pennsylvania. Oh, he's going to kiss up for the Jewish vote, isn't he? So we get to attack Egypt, Israel figures, without being blocked by the UN or by the USA. So it's Ben-Gurion as Cardinal Richelieu, you know? <laughs> right? Metternich. 
It's by, by, by Machiavelli. Israel can pack it. Oh, they worked out perfect the, 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 the plans. And all the chess were, we're back to the 18th century type of European statecraft where people plot all kind of elaborate plans. Oh, isn't this great? Ben-Gurion is wary of the British plan as it makes Israel out to be the unilateral aggressor. Does it not? After all, the plan is that Israel do the first, fire the first shot. And who knows if the British will keep their word or just leave Israel twisting in the wind. Right? They might let Israel come in and then something will happen and Eng England will say, we ain't got nothing to do with Israel. Right? And he's really worried. I mean, none of these guys trust each other a bit. France assures Ben-Gurion. France will not let this happen. Molay asked Ben-Gurion privately, says, what are your goals in the whole thing? And Ben-Gurion starts going, says, we want the Latani River, we'd like to take over Jordan, we'd like to occupy the, Sua, the, the Sinai Peninsula. I mean, he's, he's in full, full fantasy mode, you know? Um, more important, and Molay says, woo! Uh, more importantly, more importantly, France immediately and secretly delivers a vast amount of weapons plus a bunch of brand new jet fighters to Israel. This is Tachlis. In the middle of the night, French ships land near Tel Aviv. In fact, uh, Ben-Gurion and the cabinet came out secretly to watch the whole thing. And a famous Israeli poet, Nathan Alterman, wrote a poem about it. Um, but you didn't know what the poem means unless you were on the inside. Uh, this infusion of arms to Israel is a game changer. France also agrees to provide air cover for Tel Aviv, because Ben-Gurion had nightmares that Nasser, using the Soviet Aleutian bombers and the mix, will bomb Tel Aviv, which would be a catastrophe. Ben-Gurion says, though, he says, I want this all on paper. Right? I want a signed document and a secret document so the British cannot deny anything, because I know who the British are. And Selwyn Lloyd agrees and signs. Anthony Eden freaks out. He says, you signed it? Are you crazy? Where goes our plausible deniability? <laughs> See? But there are no clear goals. Ben-Gurion is thinking about conquering the world. The British want to you know, take the Suez Canal. The French want to do Algeria. You know, there's no clear goals. There's no end game. And this is a fatal, a fatal flaw. General Stockwell keeps asking Anthony Eden, what is the goal? What is the game? I can't plan properly. I can't organize my troops properly. I can't issue orders properly unless I know what the purpose is. And, and Anthony Eden does not give him any. We know from history, as they said before, the great theorists of the past, the great generals of the past, I've always said it without, it, without an end seal, as they call it, without, an ex, with, without a goal, you, you, you lose. Clausewitz wrote this in his famous book. J.C. Fuller, the famous British tactician, writes about that. He's got like a list of five or six rules which you must have in order to win. And the first one is a clear goals. Look, it's true of life. Isn't that right? What's the problem with a lot of the kids and others today? They don't, they don't know they have goals. They haven't worked out what they want to do. Ask somebody who's a young person, say, what do you plan to do? Then don't have a goal. You see? Even if they change their mind, but at least you start with some kind of idea of what you want to do. But they don't. So this is a, a, a major problem. Also, there's a lot of sloppy thinking going on regarding the UN, the USA, and the USSR. Right? They said, oh, it'll work out. The UN will be stymied, and Eisenhower's in the middle of a campaign, and the Russians are that, the Russians. This hasn't worked out. So to use contemporary bureaucratic language, this was all a plot that was not staffed out. You get what I'm saying? They didn't go really through the Israeli foreign ministry and think it through, and defense ministry, the whole French, uh, oh boy, the Quai d'Orsay, and the uh, foreign and defense ministry, and in England. That's how you have to run, so you have no choice. Instead, the top guys fooling their own guys under them so we can concoct this whole plan, and uh, they were reading too many novels. You know, uh, uh, who am I thinking of? Uh, Alexander Dumas or something like that. And, and this is what happened. Ben-Gurion, though, is very happy to be able to attack Nasser, hopefully clean out the terrorist nests and bring an end to terror attacks because all the terrorist bases, the Fedayeen, was in the Gaza Strip. If Israel conquered the Gaza Strip, they can kill these guys. I mean, that's what, let's be blunt. They can go and capture and kill these guys. And they can degrade the Egyptian military by conquering, their, destroying their weapons and all that and enjoy the cover provided by an alliance with two of the great powers. This is a scenario hitherto unthinkable for Israel. I mean, you know, I'm sure Ben-Gurion at this point in his life came as close as he ever came to believing in God. <laughs> it's highly secret, and only Paris, Israel, and Golda Meir are in the secret. 
Do you hear what I said? The Israeli people in the public. Because, you know, like Shalom Aleichem says, you tell a Yid, and the next thing you know, he says, don't tell anybody. It was only, only the top, top, top guys. I, 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 I do mean that. You know, only the very, very top people were aware that this is going to happen. The others just got their orders. Diane Perez, uh, he had to tell Golda Meir, he didn't want to tell her. Uh, it's a relic. Diane has been planning on this for a long time. I told you, he kept proposing a preventative war against uh, Egypt for over a year now, two years. And he has practiced by now general mobilization of the people. Dayan knows Israel has implemented, it costs a lot of money to have Mikriya calls, they called it, the general mobilization. And at that time, Israel didn't have the transport, so milk trucks and cabs and uh, you know, poultry things, everything gets drafted into the army. And so if you've been in Israel in 56, it's literally the streets are empty. It takes three days. That's how they worked it out. That's pretty good. It takes three days to assemble army, 100,000. Think about that. With every car and every implement, and of course, to bring the weapons there. This is, this is what they find is uh, necessary. You get an idea of the timetable over here. Uh, as a result, he's able to mobilize the army of 100,000 over the course of three days. And um, what I'm saying is the minute the conference in Sevres was over and they all flew back, Dayan implements a general mobilization, okay? So here are the, here are the dates, as you can see. And then the 24th, they left, and the mobilization over the next three days, and the war starts a few days after the conference was held. All right? And you understand, by the way, a country like Israel can't afford a long-term mobilization with everybody out of work and everybody away. They need a short, quick war, and that's what the plan is over there. To fool the Egyptians, Moshe Dayan concentrates all his armies against Jordan on the Jordanian border, making it look like it's a war to conquer the West Bank. Now, I want you to understand. Ben Gurion knew about this, but the Israeli bureaucracy didn't. Anthony Eden knew about this, but the British bureaucracy didn't. So the British bureaucracy immediately said like this, Israel's going to war against Jordan. Let's declare war on Israel. <laughs> and Ben Gurion says, I knew it was a plot on the whole time from the British Foreign Office. This whole thing was a plan to stab Israel in the back. And Anthony Eden said, no, we're just not coordinated here. You know, don't, don't worry about it. You know, once you attack Egypt, it would be clear it wasn't there and so forth. So that's how crazy this whole situation was. Uh, British Foreign Office officials warned the Israeli ambassador. They called me and said, we're, we're going to declare war on you. And the Israeli ambassador said, like, have you talked to your boss? You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's a comedy of errors, but of course it will leave Ben-Gurion and Dayan and all the Israelis all throughout the war to suspect the British betrayal, because that's what the Brits do. Now comes the moment of Moshe Dayan. He'd been dreaming all of his life. The man with zero formal military training, consider what I just said, right? Moshe Dayan is Andrew Jackson. That's the best I can think of. He never went to military school, never all the stuff. He learned it from rough and tumble fighting, air fighting, from the time he's young. And he learned all the tricks, which means that the Sinai campaign which he's gonna lead is very messy. It doesn't follow the strategy that you read in the books. Logistically, a lot of breakdowns. There's a lot of nightmares on the way, but who cares, he wins. <laughs> I mean, like Andrew Jackson, he made all the mistakes, but he won. That's, that, that's all people care about, you see? The army, I mean, in 1956, no army in the world was led by the Indian fighter. You get it? But you've heard before what the guy said. He just appointed guys officers without any, ever going to officer school. Because he's, on the basis of what? He's an Indian fighter, he's an Arab fighter. He crawls in the other thing, he throws the hand grenade, he rolls back, he's just a natural in the fight. This is the image that he cultivated, and as I said before, it's a something of an exaggeration, but they had a couple of units that were like that, and they did all the fighting, and the rest of the army wannabes, which is what you want among your soldiers. And everybody aspires to be a hero of this nature, and that's good for the morale, you see? Um, and let's face it, the Egyptian army was not the German army. Okay? That, that's important to keep in mind. Dayan has a very unusual military plan. It's sort of like this. <laughs> You'll see what I mean. You, well, hold on. What you do, nobody trusted anybody exactly. And so they say, before we do anything like that, now look at this map closely. Dayan says, we're going to take a paratrooper unit and we're going to land it right here, <laughs> all the way behind the Egyptian lines, at the, near the Mitla Pass. This is a pass, a mountain pass, which is very important to get to and from the Suez Canal. Very strategic place. We're going to land a force here under, General Raful, under Major Raful Eitan. Some of us will remember he later on was um, uh, the Israeli chief of staff. 
under Begin, and Rav Oliton was an Arab fighter, just like Moshe Dayan, except he was a little more professional. And I don't even think he was Jewish, to tell you the truth. I believe he came from what they call the Sabotniks, which are Russian Shabbos worshippers, who some of them immigrated to Palestine around 1905 or whatever. It's a whole little Parsha by itself, but I won't get into that right now. Um, the rest of the unit, command, the rest of this unit, no, that's one battalion of a unit, commanded by Ariel Sharon, would drive from Israel to that place, and the combined forces would capture the Mitla Pass, a strategic spot they wanted to deny to the Egyptians. So, again, first you land, I told you, it's like this. You know, it's like a tosis. First, you take this, and then these guys run to catch up with them, which is not the way you run a military operation. In Indian fighting it is. <laughs> you get it? That's what Daniel Boone does. And so they, 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 they do this, okay? There's a, they, they do this, keep that map there. This unorthodox plan has the advantage of looking like it's just a long range raid and not an invasion. Um, so America won't get freaked out. As far as they know, Eisenhower and Dulles, who by the way, turn out to be very well informed because how can you hide this if everybody disappears from the street? <laughs> if, if the chauffeur of the American ambassador all of a sudden can't show up that day. <laughs> you see? I mean, they didn't, it, it wasn't staffed out. If they really wanted deception on the three, see, the Russians would do it right. On the three streets near the American embassy, you had people walking around regular, <laughs> right? But the Israel, Israel didn't know how to do that. They, they, they didn't learn that stuff so well. And so as far as, the, as, far as Eisenhower and the others concerned, they say it's a big mobilization, but then it's a, a, it's a, it's a, a, a parachute drop right behind the Egyptian lines. Looks like an Indian raid, like an Arab raid. Right? It's like, no, Israel's really taking it bold this time, but it's not an invasion. Nasser, too, thinks this is not a regular invasion, otherwise, you come up front. They landed something over here, must be some kind of special uh, commando raid or something of this nature. General ha Abdul Hakim Amir, who's the command chief of the Egyptian army, who thank God was a boop, he didn't get it either. The problem is that there's bad information about the Egyptian positions in the Mitla Pass. They thought that nobody's there, and turns out there was whole large forces over there, and Sharon orders a frontal attack, and Israel has a lot of casualties as a result of this, which leads to controversy and recrimination, and it's one of the very um, ironic episodes, uh, not ironic, controversial episodes in the career of Ariel Sharon, and it means that the Sinai campaign is off to a rocky start, and they haven't heard from Eisenhower yet, but they will, my friends. I think I'll close it down now and, and hope to, to uh, carry the story forward next time. Yeah, you alluded to the yeah, Panama Canal. Now, I was living in Panama when the Carter Torrijos uh, Treaty was signed.